Hello, class. Okay, so today's lecture, we're going to talk about humidity. So, let's say we have a container that's filled with, say, water. So there's water in here. And say that initially we have a vacuum in the region above the water. So it's a sealed container, uh, nothing's going in or out, partially filled with water. And what's going to happen, um, you know, if you look at a molecular level, it's water, made out of water molecules, obviously, and they move around. Uh, they're free to move around in this container, but they're kind of stuck to this actual water. Uh, if you look at the surface, the molecules move around uh, in a somewhat random way, and the higher the temperature of the water, the faster they move. So if you look at the surface, you know, maybe you'll have a water molecule that's just randomly moving upwards, but it's probably not going to go very far because it's attracted to the other water molecules. And so, uh, unless it's moving fast enough, you know, even if it was moving upward, it's not going to be able to escape the, uh, this volume of water. However, if it's moving fast enough, then it will, this individual molecule might have enough energy to escape. And so if we start out with a vacuum, eventually we'll have some water molecules, you know, escaping uh, the water state and entering a vapor state where there's just, uh, you know, individual water molecules moving around, or water vapor. And the rate that these, like the probability of any molecule having enough energy, you know, when the conditions are right, where it's like right on the edge of the, kind of the surface of the water, and if it just happened to move in the right direction, uh, the higher the temperature, the more likely it's going to have enough energy to escape. So at a higher temperature, it's easier for the molecules to go from this water to a liquid state. And so if you have this vacuum and then you just wait, eventually you're going to find gas. So if you wait for a while, we're going to find that this region above the water is filled with a certain amount of gas. However, um, there's only so much gas that can, uh, can exist up here. And the reason why is these molecules, if they're, you know, collide with the surface, they can be recaptured. And so um, we've got gas leaving, like, so we've got uh, going from water to vapor. We also have vapor to water. And both of these are happening simultaneously. Now this water to vapor state, like the rate that molecules are leaving this volume of water and going into this vapor state, this depends on temperature. The temperature of the water. Hotter it is, uh, higher temperature, the you know, more, the greater this rate is going to be. If you look at the vapor to water state, uh, this is going to depend on the, like how much vapor there is. If you have more molecules here, there are going to be more collisions with the, the water, uh, the liquid water, and they'll be reabsorbed at a higher rate. So this depends on the number or the pressure. Uh, basically, it depends on the number of molecules, but the more molecules up here, the higher the pressure. And so if we started out with a vacuum, you know, this rate, let's say we have a constant temperature, this rate is fixed. Initially, this rate is zero because there was no, uh, the number was zero up here. Nothing's being reabsorbed back into this water state. So we've got a net result of going from water to this vapor state. However, the longer this continues, the higher the concentration, you know, just the more water molecules we have, 
which means this vapor going back into the water is going to increase. And once these two rates are equal to each other, then we have like a fixed amount of water vapor, like a fixed pressure of water vapor here, where, you know, these rates are equal. So it's not that the number of, like, there's molecules that just remain here in vapor. It's like they're going back and forth. We've got molecules being absorbed, but they're also going from water to vapor state. They're just doing so in equal amounts. And so this gives us this equilibrium value when these two rates are equal to each other. And um, there's a chart in the notes, or not a chart, a graph in the notes. I'm going to kind of draw it. When we look at the temperature, on the uh, Celsius scale, and then we look at the vapor pressure on the vertical scale. The graph is going to look something like this. Um, you know, higher temperature, you can have a higher vapor pressure in equilibrium. So again, the numbers, uh, you have to kind of look that up. This is a given in Pascal's. I'll try to put a few numbers on here. It goes from 0 to 50 degrees. Let's see this temperature in degrees Celsius. So the chart I have in the book only goes up to zero, or in the notes, it's all, I got it from the book. And then the vapor pressure in Pascal's, here's 1,000 Pascal's, up to 8,000, like say around here, this would be around 8,000 Pascal's. Now remember, uh, atmospheric pressure is around 10 to the fifth pascals. Or we can write this as 100, uh, let's say 100 times 1,000 pascals. Just for a comparison, so this is 1,000 pascals, this is 8,000 pascals. Normal atmospheric pressure is 100,000 pascals. So these numbers are much lower and that's because we're just looking at the vapor pressure of water. Where uh, atmospheric pressure, we have uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and water vapor, the main components of just ordinary air. Uh, there's also trace gases like carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, which is hopefully a trace gas because you don't want too much of that around. And so, um, what this means, that's called partial pressure. So if you look at the uh, partial pressure of water vapor, say you have air, which contains all these things, if you just removed everything else and just left those air molecules in there, that would be the pressure that we're seeing. And this is the uh, vaporization curve, they call it, for water vapor. It's a function of temperature. And again, this graph only goes to 50 degrees. It would kind of be nice if we went to 100 degrees because that would, uh, you know, that's when water actually boils. And this graph could tell you kind of what uh, pressure you need. Uh, well, this would give you the boiling point of water. Um, so in order for water to boil, you know, if you just put water on a stove and turn on the heat, Eventually, you see these bubbles forming. So if you have water, if you look at a bubble, this is filled with air. And um, in order for this bubble to survive, you know, it's surrounded by water, which is pushing inwards. And so if you're at a low temperature, you know, the pressure of this bubble pushing outwards, there's air inside that's pushing outwards, but at very low temperatures, the, uh, the outward pressure of the air is not going to be nearly enough to compensate for the water pushing inwards. This will basically be an atmospheric pressure on the outside. 
Uh, now, the pressure of water depends a little bit on the depth. But again, if you just look like a pot of water on the stove, that's not going to be all that significant. So we're basically dealing with atmospheric pressure. And so these water bubbles, the air inside has to be at atmospheric pressure in order for these bubbles to be able to uh, exist. Otherwise, they'd just be crushed. And so, um, yeah, his vaporization curves can kind of tell you what... Uh, what the boiling point is going to be for a given pressure. Okay, so now let's talk about humidity. So by definition, we call it the relative humidity. Now, just to save space, I'm going to write PP. PP is partial pressure. So it's the partial pressure of water vapor divided by the equilibrium vapor pressure. And this is what you get from looking at that vaporization curve. So you can always look this up. If you ever need uh, to know this value, you can look it up. So like at a given temperature, there's this equilibrium vapor pressure, but the amount of moisture in the air can be significant, you know, doesn't have to be this equilibrium vapor pressure. This is kind of like the maximum. If you exceed this, then you'll get droplets forming and basically you get rain. So basically this is going to be a number between zero and one. So like this is how much water uh, is actually in the air. This is kind of like our maximum amount. So the relative humidity is uh, kind of like what percentage of a maximum uh, like water pressure we can have at a given temperature. And again, that depends on the conditions. Uh, now, get an example you can go over. Uh, now, I'm going to have to just write down some values, but I'll first read the problem. All right, so a woman has been outdoors where the temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. And then she goes into a room where it's 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so she was outdoors. She walks into a 25 degrees Celsius house and her glasses steam up. And the question is, uh, find the smallest possible value for the relative humidity of the room. So what we need to do is, let's look up this vaporization curve, which again, you can look in your book, but I'll just write down the numbers. At 10 degrees Celsius, we have 1400 pascals. And at 25 degrees Celsius, we have 3,000 3, pascals. So again, you'd look up those values from this vaporization curve. Okay. Uh, now, we know that the relative um, humidity in the room is less than or equal to 1. So the partial pressure in the room... Um, yeah, let's say partial pressure less than or equal to 3,000 pascals. It's obviously going to be greater than zero, but uh, yeah, it has to be less than or equal to 3,000 because that's the maximum you could have in this room. However, her glasses weren't steamed up when she was outside of the room. Uh, so when she goes, when she comes in the room from outside, her glasses steam up. So her glasses are at 10 degrees Celsius. So she's in a room where her glasses are 10 degrees Celsius, but the room is at 25. And so there has to be at least, the partial pressure 
has to be at least 1,400 pascals. So, um, so that her glasses will steam up. If it was less than that, uh, then the relative humidity would still be less than one. And so, um, actually, I'm going to make this a less than 3,000. So we know that her glasses steam up when she enters the room. So there has to be at least 1,400 pascals to reach that relative humidity to cause steam to form on the, her 10 degree Celsius glasses. But there has to be less than 3,000. And so the minimum relative humidity, I'll just say R is relative humidity, that would just be 1,400. That's the partial pressure of water vapor. Now we don't know for sure what the partial pressure of water vapor in the room is, but it has to be at least 1,400. So the minimum relative humidity could be a little higher than this. And the equilibrium value, we know that's in the room, that's 3,000. So we have 1,400 over 3,000. Uh, 1,500 over 3,000 would be 0.5. This is a little bit less than that. I'll just check. So that'd be 0.47 would be the minimum relative humidity. Could be higher, but definitely can't be less than that. Otherwise, uh, her glasses would not have steamed up if it was less than that. Okay, um, now normally relative humidity is expressed as a percentage. So we can say R min is 47%. Okay. So that's uh, this idea of relative humidity, which you know you hear a lot about. If you watch like Weather Channel or something, so uh, we don't do too much with it, but just something worth going over. But yeah, that's all we're going to talk about when it comes to uh, like relative humidity. So that'll be it for this one.